Greetings all. Time for another Q&A where I sit here trying to answer the questions that you put to me. As always, priority to the patrons, but I will take good questions from other sources. First up, yes, I know I don't pronounce Porsche correctly. Decades of bad habits, forgive me when I mess it up. Second, I did slightly over egg the pudding when I said the Sentinel wasn't really an Australian tank, particularly with regard to the gearbox. Since they lacked the ability to create the desired gearbox, they ended up using a locally designed crash gearbox. Not pretty, but it was domestic and it did work. Finally, I may be traveling again. Keep an eye out on my Facebook page. See if I am not in some outdoors pub around Fort Benning the evening of the 26th of May. Anyway, on with the questions. And starting with John, what are my thoughts on Israeli armor? It's a very large subject for such a short question. The fundamental thing is that Israel designs its equipment for very specific sets of requirements. And it also understands matters of sustainment. Its desire to make sure all its tanks use the same engine and gun, for example, not just for capability, but also to simplify maintenance and supply. It also need not worry too much about expeditionary capabilities. Pretty much any battlefield Israel has been involved with has been within the fuel tank capacity of a vehicle, at least when unimposed. As a result, they have made very logical decisions given the natures of the terrain and the expected opposition. Most other nations would not make the same decisions as Israel did, which is one of the nice things about modeling Israeli armor. You get to do something which looks completely different. The other item to note, and this is probably derived from the Israeli habit of modifying anything it gets, is the amount of upgrade components which Israel has placed on the open market. Michael Prothro. How do I feel about gun-launched ATGMs? Why aren't they used much on Western tanks, barring the hat? I've seen Israeli trend coming on in this Q&A. Lack of purpose, it seems. Uh, there aren't many situations where a Western MBT needs to fire a missile round. It can be done. You just need to replace the laser rangefinder with a combination designator rangefinder, and indeed the Germans tried it out with a Leopard 2A4 for trials. But Lahat shoots at 8 kilometer ranges and above. Such fields of fire are not particularly common for most Western nations, no, at least not in places where there aren't plenty of other assets capable of also doing the job. Leon Wu, thoughts on the T-72 M2 Moderna with a pair of autocannon on each side of the turret. I seem to recall covering something like this a Q&A or two ago. It's worth noting that that was just the first prototype. The second prototype had but a single autocannon on the right rear of the turret, and it came at the cost of a commander's machine gun. Such systems have the advantage of having a high angle of elevation for urban fights with the disadvantage of overloading the crew and limited ammunition for the autocannon. Obviously, folks have been mucking around with the idea for quite some time, and it's probably telling that no country has really adopted them. It seems that if you're going to go dealing with urban combat, have an accompanying vehicle and troops. And if you really want something for anti-helicopter defense, it's probably lighter and simpler to just stick a man pads on the roof, but like the North Koreans seem to love doing. Adam Schindler, back in the Dark Ages, circa 2010. I read an account of a US general who was involved in the development of the F-22's cockpit and said, computers are good integrators of information while humans are good differentiators. We've tried to design the user interface around that distinction. Does that apply to the UI in tanks? It's an interesting question. I had not really considered such a thing, and I can only speculate as to how the F-22 cockpit uses the distinction. For example, I can certainly see how the aircraft's computer might be able to process and link together multiple sources of information, such as radar emission, IR emission, and data link, and so on, so that the pilot doesn't need to figure out that all those three sources together equals one blip, and that he's in range of all of them with missile X. A tank, though, will have fewer such sources of information to integrate. It already does a lot of it with taking all the data used by a modern fire control computer and taking it out of the hands of the gunner. I'm sure it's possible to integrate a system so that a, you know, let's say a laser warning receiver will cue a thermal imager to a target which then locks itself onto a hotspot for engagement. Maybe the battlefield tracker can similarly integrate into the display to show no fire zones or estimated friendlies and the like. Or Tell the driver, no, this bridge won't hold your weight. But really, in a three or four man crew, they haven't gotten to the point of information or processing overload yet to require such levels of automation. They're just nice to have. So 
The discrimination for the crew is still which one to shoot first, where to move to, and does that look like good ground for the tank to be? And I don't see how that can be integrated by a computer to be more useful. So yeah, it seems to me the tank UIs do integrate what little information can be integrated and just leave the mass, vast majority of it to judgment calls to the humans. Leon Patera Malone. A project has started to design a modern support tank. What am I designing this tank to do? I, what are you arming it with? How do you integrate it into the armor division? What features must it have? It's a very broad question, and your first question of that lot nails the problem. What am I designing the tank to do? Now, I've discussed in the past how the military kind of bounces in between developing equipment to meet doctrinal requirements, or taking something newly invented and then seeing whether or not it has a place in doctrine. If you want to do a bit of hair pulling, look for the JSIDS process flow chart. That's the Joint Capabilities Integration and Development System. I'm speaking here now of the US process. Part of the system is the Capabilities Based Assessment, which includes the Functional Needs Analysis. This determines whether or not there is some capabilities gap which needs fielding. What shortcomings are you trying to fix? And then you go into the .mlpfp analysis. That's doctrine, organization, training, materiel, leadership and education, personnel, facilities, policy. In this, they look at the problem area by area to see what the best solution is for solving the identified problem which needs fixing. So for doctrine, is it possible that the doctrine is wrong? Should we not be bringing tanks into the situation which requires escort, and instead should we be relying on air power? Organization. If we reorganize assets we already have, such as maybe pairing a tank with a Bradley, will that fix the problem? Training. Do people simply not know the fine details of how to operate in accordance with the doctrine? Materiel. Do we need a new thing or gadget in order to fix the problem? And so on. So as you can see, it's not really a simple matter to say we need a support tank. And you will note how few countries have come to the conclusion that they need a support tank, let alone exactly what it is that the support tank is supposed to look like. It's worth noting that BMPT was developed by Ural Vagon Zavod independently, not in response to a requirement by the Russian Ministry of Defense. The closest I might think to the requirement would be a heavy IFV, but even then, they don't seem to be in widespread service. Instead, heavy APCs seem to be the predominant solution for that. So the question isn't quite so much, what would a support tank look like, as much as, what do you want one for in the first place? The only country which seems really to have gotten in on the concept is Algeria, which started taking deliveries of 300 BMP T-72s last summer. Now, what exactly they're planning on doing with the things remains to be seen. Presumably it meets some identified need that Algeria has, which no other country has as yet felt requires such an investment. So, Leon, long answer to tell you, I have no idea, simply because, like apparently most militaries, I have no idea what I'd want one for. The best tank escort vehicles I can think of are either an IFV or an air defense vehicle. Matthew Lesich. During World War II, which country's armored forces were underrated and why? Are there any which are underrated today? Well, I'll say that with nearly 600 T-90s to 300 Terminators and 500 Boxers, Algeria certainly slipped under my radar until I did the research for the previous question. I don't know if underrated is quite the right word, but I might say treat with more caution than many seem to uh, for certain countries, which includes particularly China. The stuff may well be better than we think, but it also may not be, so you, you can't say it's underrated. Better to assume that they're good though. Normally, countries which are better than you might think are also well enough known so you don't think poorly of them in the first place. Look at Singapore or UAE, two small countries which shed loads of tanks, uh, but this is well known. And then there's the matter of training, I mean, so let's take Chile. And not exactly still using the Shermans that they were famous for, and now they're running around with Leopard 2s and Martyrs. Are they actually any good at using them? I have absolutely no clue. Is there any reason to believe that they're not? With World War II, finding overrated armored forces is easier than finding underrated ones. 
And in the early part of the war, I guess you can make a claim for the Soviet army being underrated, possibly Sweden as well. But by the end of the war, I don't think anybody was under any delusions about the Red Army's armored force being as good as it was. And Sweden just never really kept up with the arms rate, so genuinely couldn't be inaccurately rated as poorly. But the other tank-using nations? I mean, really, can anyone think of any which were genuinely better than the beliefs of the time indicated? Maybe Japan? I mean, its use of tanks in the early war certainly had moments of excellence and results, but I don't know if anybody particularly expected them to be poor. Usually it went the other way around, with forces being considered better than it turned out that they actually were. J. Modern tanks have intercoms for the crew, yet in gunnery the loader can be heard yelling up. Is this accurate? Why yell when you got an intercom? And are they not blowing the crew's ears off? Well, it's not a full-on yell, but yeah, it is kind of set above normal speaking volume. I think there's a couple of reasons for this. Firstly, there's usually a bit of adrenaline involved, so it's partially subconscious. Secondly, it's a very short call and it's a very noisy environment, so being louder means there's less chance of the call being missed. So again, I don't know if that's necessarily a conscious decision to shout, just the mind taking over a bit given the circumstances. And no, it's not going to blow your ears off. Felicity Longus. Now your question gets an answer which is the better part of 10 minutes long, so look for a specific vehicle on your subject in a couple of days. It's about the M18. Caleb Engelhart. Have I come across a documented instance of Panther or Tiger road wheels being stuck in place due to frozen mud? I definitely remember reading it, possibly in some memoir, but I can't cite it off the top of my head. I have to go through the library and start looking at books. More than I have time for right now. Had Germany won the war, what vehicles would have continued to see service? Probably Panther, except product improved. I can see King Tiger staying in production as well. The Jagdpanzer IV is an interesting option, originally developed as a Stungeschutz, and so if Germany had won, I'm sure that they would have learned that the Stungeschutz would have been worth continuing. So possibly with a little less armor up front, it likely could have continued in production. Although I do think there would have been an argument for Stug Panthers, basically like a smaller Jagdpanther in effect. Jagdpanzer 38T, Jagdtiger, well, they would have gone away. I can see the 251 being removed from production as well, replaced by Katchen. I wouldn't be surprised if they built their own copy of the Jeep and sorted out their 6x6 truck problem. The really big question is whether or not they would have restarted Mouse and E100 production. Common sense would say no, but common sense also would say that they wouldn't have started those projects in the first place, so who knows? Also, Jay, where are the table and shelves from? I seem to recall that the shelves came from Crate and Barrel, although my memory's a bit off on that, and I'm pretty sure the desk is made by Hooker. And I've actually had an interesting number of people asking me that. Minion. In the late desert campaign, how well did the teaming up of early model Tigers with Panzer III Asferung Ns work in practice? I've no idea. For those who aren't tracking, Schwerer Panzer Abteilung 501 had five Panzer III Ns with the short 7.5 centimeter gun in the Stubbs company, and both first and second companies had nine Tigers each partnered with 10 Panzer III Ns. That, that's per company, not like 10 Panzer III Ns each Tiger. So uh, they were an integral part of the unit and not just attachments or cross org. I guess you'll have to draw your own conclusions. The reports coming back from the field about the Panzer III and in general were, to quote a German document from November 1942, extremely positive. So the troops certainly seem to have liked the combination of the small reliable tank with the 7.5 centimeter high explosive punch. However, it's also difficult to find instances of such integration of Panzer III's with Tigers later in the war, so make of that what you will. I have not encountered, nor honestly have I looked for, any unit evaluations of the combination. So if anybody out there has, feel free to comment below and I'll come back to it in the next Q&A. Mikkel Skipper, question about tanks and the noise they make, which is both an advantage and a disadvantage. We used to make use of friendly tanks to mask the uh, noise of movement of other units. And the Germans supposedly would run tanks around near Poland before the invasion to unnerve Polish troops. 
Are there any doctrines in modern armies which use the sound of tanks for tactical uses? Not so much for the M1. Because the turbines are pretty quiet, it can't really disguise anything with them. The loud part of an M1 on the move is the sound of the tracks, both whirring around and slamming onto the ground. As a result, in Iraq it was impossible for us to partake in a firefight which didn't involve us to begin with, as they would hear the tanks coming from like a mile away or more and you know, disengage rapidly. So it's going like, and off they went. However, if an M1 is proceeding slowly, and you know, would say trackpad to trackpad, which is basically like the tank version of tiptoeing, I kid you not, I've gotten my M1 to within 10 meters of a chap without his knowing that I was there which caused him quite the shock when the little voice inside his head said, look left. To be clear, it was a busy city street, but still. Now, if it was a leopard, I'm pretty sure he'd have heard it. Still, standard practice is to act as if your tank noises can be heard, although I seriously suspect that a lot of it is just holdovers from the M60 days. For example, a short count on the radio net so that all the tank engines start at once and it's impossible to hear just how many tanks have started. I mean, if you're close enough to hear M1 starting up, you're probably close enough to hear everything else going on. Or just count turrets in today's days when it seems like every platoon has a drone. The main use of tank engine noises is to use non-tanks for deception purposes. Not unusual in the desert, especially if the deception units are dragging chains along behind them to create the dust clouds. Indeed, there are even US deception units which used M10s with massive speaker arrays in the turret. So not only did they look like tanks if they were actually spotted, but they sounded more like war tanks. Deception is still a thing in militaries today, even in the US. We probably don't emphasize it as much as some of the other NATO countries. I mean, the British, for example, are heavily into the concept, but I guess the US feels like it doesn't really need to be particularly subtle. Whether or not they bother with audio signatures, though, I'm not sure about it. The US Army's field manual on deception is FM 3-13.4, approved for public release, so you can go download it and have a read of the 90-some pages yourself. Two points from the manual are Magruder's principle, which states that it is easier to induce a target to maintain a pre-existing belief than to deceive him into changing a belief, and Jones's dilemma which means that as there are more ways for a target to confirm or deny a suspicion, it gets harder to deceive them. But on the other hand, if you can deceive by multiple methods at once, the deception is more likely to be believed. Josh Conti, can I explain the use of British armored forces during military operations during the Troubles? And what was it like to live in Ireland at the time? Well, the first one is easy enough. Barring wheeled APCs, the British Army didn't use armor. The one exception was Operation Motorman, a massive undertaking which basically broke the Catholic insurgency and turned it into a terrorist campaign instead. Centurion AVREs were used to breach the barricades to allow the lighter vehicles to pass through. That was pretty much the only use of heavy armor in the entire period. As for what it was like, I only just caught the tail end of it, and even at that, you know, only made ever two forays into the north. It may have only been 150 miles away, but it really didn't affect us in Dublin. It just became part of the 6-1 news, like anywhere else, really. Suffice to say, I was one of the 94% of the population who voted in 1998 that it really wasn't worth all the bother, and can we live on a peaceful island now, please? That referendum, if you don't know, changed the Irish Constitution to remove the territorial claim on the north. Generally, it seems to have worked out. That said, I've not been north of the border since 1994 or so. As face, tanks in Southeast Asia. The British concluded that tanks were impractical in Malaya's jungle terrain and were proven wrong, since Japan used tanks in their attack, and the US stationed tanks in the Philippines from the very beginning. Why did the US Army and IJA reach different conclusions on the use of tanks in jungles to the British Army? Well, for starters, I'm not sure I would say that the jungles of Malaya and the plains of the Philippines were quite the same. Operations in central and southern Luzon were as close to European conditions as existed in the Pacific, to the point that the Japanese had an entire tank division on the island in the defense. The defense plan for the Philippines at the beginning of the war for the US made no intention of moving with anything, let alone tanks, into the dense jungles of northern Luzon. So I'm not entirely sure I agree with the premise that the US use of tanks in the Philippines was indicative of similar thinking to Japan 
versus that of the UK. Now, that said, the British position also requires clarification. I've seen several books where it says that the British didn't think that the terrain was suitable for tanks, which may have been true from their perspective perhaps, but they obviously were not so utterly convinced of this that they didn't think to bring anti-tank guns along just in case the opposition didn't agree. Australian troops in particular took something of a toll on Japanese tank forces along the way. It seems as likely to me that the British simply felt that there were better places to send what tanks they had, Malaya simply being less suitable compared to, say, North Africa or India. Tom Hardy. What colour was the bottom of German World War II armour? What colour was the bottom of your tank? I don't know. I'll look underneath the next time I have a chance, but I'll lay bets they were the base colour of grey or dunkelgelb. My tank was green underneath. I don't recall if it was camouflage or not, and you'd need to look for a photo of a flipped M1, I guess. I don't recall it being camouflaged. Christ in. How do you defend against ATGMs? What ATGM or anti-ATGM systems exist and how do they work? Well, step one, identify the launch, if you can. Fortunately, most missiles have some form of signature. Step two, announce Sagger, X o'clock. If you're on the move, commence the Sagger dance. Uh, no, it doesn't matter that it's not an actual Sagger. It's like saying any vacuum cleaner is a Hoover or any cab hat is a Stetson. The Sagger dance is basically the tank trying to jink to throw off the other guy's aim. These days, it's of limited benefit unless you can get a second factor in, other than just making a driver feel better. Step three, send a round back down range. The chances are your round is faster than his missile. It'll probably miss, but it might make him flinch. If it's a fire and forget missile, it won't help, but you won't know that. Pop smoke, then reverse obliquely a bit. It's such a simple thing to do that people forget that they can do. In the 2006 Lebanon excursion, an Israeli tank battalion took another battery from Hezbollah missiles. Of the 30-some-odd tanks present, not a single one of the commanders thought to pop smoke. It's honestly the best defense with multispectral smoke. Only radar-guided missiles such as longbow hellfires should be able to continue to home in on you. You probably can't see out, but at least you'll survive the first salvo, and you'll be able to have a crack at getting the first aimed shot off next time. Assuming that he's even reloaded by then. At least if it's a man portable launcher anyway. Then you have the active defenses. Soft kill systems such as Dazzlers or hard kill such as Trophy or Arena. And finally, of course, you got the armor. So ERA composite and other anti-chemical effect round mechanisms would do nicely. Alexander H. I once mentioned that we and the staff developed a plan to defend our fob against zombie attack in Afghanistan. Can I share some details? Absolutely. So, of course, this was done mainly for the say, partially for the sake of entertainment and partially for the sake of actually running the processes. So even the CDC says you probably should consider your zombie defense plan. Because the things that you do for a zombie defense plan are probably at many shared things that you would do with a hurricane survival plan or an earthquake survival plan, things like that. So when you get to a new base, uh, or not a new base, you take over from a base that's already pre-existing from a, a previous unit, they will hand you the battle book. And it's the, the book of standard operating procedures that they've already done a lot of the hard work. If this happens, do this, call them, and so on. But there's no exercise in just reading the book. So we ran through a, let's create a zombie defense plan exercise to go through the entire process of, you know, analyzing the problem, coming up with possible solutions to deal with the problem and so on. And our base at the time was a joint base with Afghan forces, kind of split into two with a, with a wall down the middle. And so we had the Afghan liaison there. You guys don't already have a zombie defense plan, do you? What? Uh, didn't think so, just checking. Do you know what a zombie is? What? The zombie, do you know what one is? Uh, maybe you call it something else. Okay, here's the concept behind a zombie explain a zombie and uh, no we have no such thing okay problem number one half our base cannot identify the enemy 
Uh, so that, that was the first criterion. Then we had to have a think about this because if you're going up in, you know, it's a zombie apocalypse, you're probably screwed anyway in the long term. But uh, then you got the question, well, how important is effectiveness versus style? And uh, so we had to think about that one. We decided, you know, okay, well, let's see if we can get a little bit of style points in somehow. So we decided that uh, one of the primary forms of defense is going to be airburst artillery because you know, you've got to get the brains. So airburst coming down from the top will, will do nicely. But you're going to have all those, you know, the crawlers, the guys that have lost their limbs below and they're just crawling along with their arms. And, um, and it turned out we had a road construction unit on the base as well and they had road rollers. So we figured that once you know, you, you'd fired off the artillery, you'd, you'd finish off the job with the road rollers. Uh, there were a couple of them. We put a fair bit of thought into this. Anyway, I don't know. We, we handed over the battle book to the subsequent unit, but I, I don't know what they thought of it. George Paramore. Historically, what has typically been the first design principle for new tank guns? Caliber, penetration, turret sizes, shell shot weight, etc. Probably depends on the era and the nation, I guess. The British in World War II, for example, basically had a directorate of artillery, which developed the guns, and the directorate of mechanization, which developed the vehicles. It was the job of some poor schmuck to figure out how to put the one onto the other. And if you look at the development of British tank guns in the war, you will see that the three famous ones, 2-pounder, 6-pounder, and 17-pounder, were all developed first as towed guns, and then they tried to shoehorn the things into a tank. Not necessarily well. The 75mm would be an exception, though that did have the criterion of commonality with all the US ammo which was coming over. They weren't alone in this. The US had a similar problem for a while in the interwar period. Will it fit became an overriding criterion after a while. Witness the 77mm for the British or the 76mm for the US for where the 17 pounder or the 3 inch, which fire exactly the same projectiles as the 77 and the 76, would not fit. These days it seems armor penetration is at the top of the list for an MBT, but it really does come down to what you want the tank to do and how much money and resource time you have to spend on developing a gun for the tank. B7. Everyone knows about the Bob Semple, and there's the lesser known NI tank, effectively a Ukrainian equivalent. There are probably many more improvised AFVs. Are there any cases of successful combat use of these vehicles? even if just a psychological effect. Actually, yes, you mentioned it, the tank which goes ni. Made by the Odessa shipyards out of the STZ-5 artillery tractor, 68 of them were built, and though, yeah, they would have perhaps been a bit outclassed by the Germans, they ended up fighting against the Romanians. And you know, silly though the tanks may have looked, against what the Romanians had, what you have basically is a military service chassis and powertrain, two machine guns and armor plate. It was good enough. Of course, today there are all sorts of homemade vehicles created, especially around Syria, and some even are designed to transport exoskeleton Iron Man type suits. Thunderchild. The US Army is seeking submissions for a new and needed AFV. What do you think is something the US needs replaced or a vacant need filled by the XM87 Morin? Why 87? I'll go for a new cavalry vehicle. The US cavalry hasn't had a truly purpose designed vehicle really since World War II. Although I guess an argument could be made for the M114, which wasn't exactly a resounding success. It should be smaller and more nimble than the Bradley for recon, but it still has to have the firepower to conduct the range of cavalry tasks that the US Army's cavalry is doctrinally supposed to do. It probably will end up looking a bit like a mini Bradley or an enlarged XM800T. General Jack Ripper, have I ever seen a commie drink a glass of water? Well, I am, I can't say I have, Jack. Yeah. Though I do note the argument that they drink vodka and never water. It is worth noting that the word vodka is derived from voda, which is Russian for water. It is not unique to commies, however. Note that ishka is Irish for water, from which is derived ishka baha, the water of life and thus whiskey. And then there's aquavit from the Nordic countries, which translates as water of life. And the French have eau de vie, which translates as water of life, and it's a type of brandy. 
Then there's the Roman aqua vitae, which is water of life, and Ukraine has uh, oca vitae, uh, water of life. One starts to see a trend. One does wonder though, if one could get creative and if you were put on a diet of bread and water. No, was cross that bridge if I ever get there. Andrew, what is my opinion on the new army green service uniform and related items? I like it, a lot. Best new uniform we've had for a long time. However, I don't like it enough to spend a thousand dollars on a bloody thing with accessories. The saving grace is that we have quite a few years before the mandatory possession date, so I may be able to see out my career without having to buy one. I find it an interesting comparison to the change from the grey to the black PT uniforms, which seem to be a case of my waking up one morning only to discover that the uniform had changed. I am not convinced by the Air Force's style crushed cap, but I acknowledge that there are some folks who may like it. It may also take up less space on the shelf, which is a positive, I guess. Stryker 1959. How did German equipment such as tanks end up in the post-war Middle Eastern conflicts? Czechoslovakia, Spain and France. The two obvious items are the ME109 and the Panzers. The ME109 continued to be built by Avia as the S199 with a new engine. They weren't particularly good, but they did form Israel's first fighter squadron. And the Israelis in 1948 were not in a position to be picky. After the war, the Czechs operated over 200 Panzer IVs in service, but by the 1950s, they were starting to fall a bit out of favor. About 50 of them were sold to Syria in 1955. A few more came from France, where they were sitting around in stores, and 17 virtually factory fresh Panzer IVs were delivered from Spain in 1965. Alongside the Panzer IVs, about two dozen Stung III's were sold by France, Czechoslovakia, and Spain. Six Jägerpanzers came from France in 1950, together with five Hummels. Officer Crabtree, good morning. A certain discussion a short while ago about the merits of having the Green Mace 5-inch automatic AA gun on a self-propelled mount as a tank destroyer. Aside from the obvious need for a large vehicle to carry the thing at the 96 rounds per minute, what are the pros and cons of such a system? Would anyone have considered it for service? Except maybe Albonia. So for those who don't know, Green Mace was going to be an absolutely massive thing which required a gun trailer, an ammunition trailer, and a power trailer. Though labeled a 5 inch, the prototype which was built ended up using a 102mm. What's interesting is, for an AA gun, it was intended to fire fin stabilized discarding Sabo ammunition. Which begs the question, what happens to the rounds on the way back down again once it misses or even hits the airplane, but anyway. It's not impossible to fit an explosive warhead to fin stabilize Sabo ammunition, see the MPAT round for example. But what you have then is a gun which in theory should be quite effective against armor of the 1950s. So really it's not the worst idea. The rate of fire is stupidly high. The 36 rounds per minute of some of the contemporary US autoloader tanks was plenty fast enough. After all, you want to be able to sense the round and the effects on target before firing the next shot. Reloading is going to take a few minutes after all. But let's say the autoloader can be detuned to maybe half speed or... 28 rounds of ammunition capacity is nice, but remember you want to try to get the thing to fit into a self-propelled vehicle, so maybe six round revolvers are again demonstrated as being feasible by US autoloaders, so maybe one or even two of them will be a lot more reasonable than the large magazines on the Green Mace prototype. The gun can probably be mounted much lower, as there isn't the same need for the high angle of elevation, so of course as you elevate the breech and all the autoloading system has to go down as well. So it can be done. The question though becomes just how much merit is there to the idea? If the normal process for a berm drill is you pop up, you fire two rounds with the tank before dropping back down to avoid return fire, which takes, say, five or six seconds, just how much bang are you going to get for your five or six seconds of exposure for a green mace tank destroyer, if you think about the entire lay, engage, assess cycle? The big advantage really is that you can put two rounds into each of two targets in an engagement instead of one. But if the tank is expected to normally kill the target with a single hit, double tapping is really just a luxury of ammunition. 
So is it really worth the money and manpower into building this new tank destroyer vehicle? Becomes arguable at least. Hammer of Terror. Whilst nuclear artillery was very much extant in the Cold War, was any effort ever made to develop nuclear tank shells? N nuclear. N I don't know how you pronounce it in American. Or were such factors as near certain proximity to tanks to the blast uh, sufficient to ensure that the idea never got off the drawing board? I don't think proximity was such a problem. If it was considered acceptable to lob nukes from unarmored jeeps, then firing from armored tanks is surely within the acceptability bounds. I would say it's more a question of whether or not it's possible to miniaturize around such that it would work in something the size of a tank round. And then the question of if there's any point to it at all, because I mean, if you can lob nukes by artillery or a man-packed tripod, I, if you're in such a situation that you need to fire a tank-sized nuke, just get on the radio and ask for support from one of the non-tank nukes. Thunderchild, what is my favorite variant of the Le Mans Russ? Much though I am a fan of the Vanquisher, the reality is that I tend to feel the bog-standard Russ in games as a general purpose tank. On occasion my demolisher may make an appearance, but I found it a little bit limited. Admiral Tiberius, who learned more from the Six Day War and Yom Kippur Wars, NATO or Warsaw Pact? And is the love of the KV-2 with the 152mm wrong? I think both sides learned some extremely valuable lessons. If he hasn't covered it yet, go ask Drach how NATO reacted to the naval engagements in 1967. NATO and Israel both basically realized that they needed to make some very significant changes in order to survive in the new anti-ship missile environment, and the results were very evident and to the astonishment of the Egyptians and Soviets in 1973. Actually, 1973 had all sorts of astonishments. The Egyptian crossing into Suez was considered a virtual impossibility without nukes by the Soviets and required at least a week in Western thinking. Both sides had to seriously rethink their opinions on such things after the Egyptians proved them wrong. Similarly, the devastating effects of ATGMs against armor surprised even the Soviets, who supplied the things. Suppression of missile teams was the primary reason that BMP-2 swapped out the 73mm gun for an autocannon, and was also an important factor in the consideration of the chain gun for the Bradley. I'm not sure I can think of any particularly dramatic revelations other than that. Most everyone knew the importance of training, the Jordanians being the best trained and thus the toughest oppositions, or the advantages of western tanks in the defence. And of course the experience in 1973 was the primary guideline for Merkava with its rear turret and door, which it's worth noting neither Warsaw Pact nor NATO countries followed. Loch Ness Hamster if an armoured unit comes under chemical attack, how long can it stay buttoned up? The normal requirement is 24 hours. You'd be a little bit hungry, and hopefully you left some canteens of water inside, but that's the general thinking. In reality, I presume two or three days would be theoretically possible, but I can't imagine how you would do that without running out of fuel and battery to run the NBC systems. The Swedish Armour Museum director observed that if there was any test that the M1 was far superior to the Leopard 2 in when they were running trials, it was the ability to survive 24 hours in a chemical environment. Is it possible to operate a tank in full MOP4? And that's the, the full getup, gloves, boots, hoods, etc. Yes, although I wouldn't be thrilled about doing it, just the mask alone is bad enough. Seaburn engagements are mandatory in a US tank qualification, and you need to wear the mask to do it. Is it absolutely required if you have an overpressure system? Probably not, but why not be hell, you know, why not take advantage of it? Plus the air is forced into your mask, so it makes breathing quite easy compared to a standard protective mask. For those who are curious, the masks do come with drinking tube, which interfaces with the canteen cover so you can drink safely. So if you ever wonder what this little lid up here was for, you put it off and you attach your drinking tube, which is integral to your mask, into the canteen cup, uh, canteen cover, forgive me. You also will attach a microphone to the front of your mask and sort of hooks into the crewman helmet in the plug socket that the boom mic plugs into. Joe Powell, 
I've mentioned the relatively low number of US tankers killed in World War II and the British subject suggesting that the protective effects of berets was not the standard. Might another factor be that the British did more tank-on-tank -tank fighting? In raw numbers perhaps, but in terms of loss ratios, I'm not sure it would have made very much of a difference. The problem was particularly so in Normandy for two reasons. Firstly, the British were in tank country to the east, and they also started running out of infantry and had no choice but to take hideous tank losses such as Goodwood. But towards the end of the war I suspect the Americans actually ended up facing more armour such as the Bulge and Alsace operations, which would have evened things out a bit. I guess the question to ask is, of all the tankies the Brits sent overseas, how many came home again? Sim Crawford, congrats on Lieutenant Colonel. Thank you. What's the most ingenious way I've seen a piece of equipment used for something which it wasn't intended for? I don't know about ingenious, I, mean, I remember when we mobilized in 2004 they shipped our container of equipment to the new armory but they forgot to give us a container loader to take the thing off the truck. We ended up having to use two forklifts borrowed from a warehouse across the street. And then, because forklifts are not designed to operate in dirt and gravel, we had to undertake a recovery mission to rescue the one forklift with the other forklift. That said, I can't really think of anything off the top of my head. I'm sure folks can chime in on the comment section below. Oxygen. A conversation came up in a group on how Army Reserve training cycles work. What's the limiting factor on size of training elements? And at what level do officers go from reserve to full-time? I am fairly sure that's a discussion currently quite heated in both Ireland and the UK right now. Both have, in recent years, changed their reserve structures from the FCA and the TA respectively to Army Reserve. And in both cases it's more than just a change in the name. Your single biggest limiting factor is going to be the manpower pool. You have to have enough people near to the unit to fill it up. Different countries have different perspectives on what reasonable distances are. In my 20 years in the National Guard, my shortest commute was about 70 miles each way, for all of four months. Home of record to my current unit of assignment is 550 miles, according to Google Maps. A British reservist may balk at going to the other side of the city. Current US regulation defines a reasonable commuting distance as 150 miles. For a Brit, that's about the distance between Luton to Leeds. Then again, it is rare for a US reserve unit to be on training for less than two days. British or Irish units will meet up for a couple of hours on a particularly weekday evening, with occasional field exercises on weekends. I personally think that this latter mechanism is highly inefficient, but the Brits do seem some merit to it, such as using the weekday evening before a range day to do all the refresher training. It also means that one does not have to sacrifice many weekends, unlike the US system where it basically lost one weekend out of every four for the last two decades. Birthdays, anniversaries, etc. A British reservist isn't asked to give them up anywhere near as much as an American. Army doesn't care of course, but if you're trying to get volunteers to volunteer their time, especially in countries where the pay and benefits for showing up are negligible, these are the sorts of things you have to think about. As for size, the real killer is minimum size. There have to be enough people present to make the collective training worth the time. You can't conduct company and attack exercises if your unit is staffed at only 40 people. Instructors have to be made available and it's more efficient to train 20 people on you know, the operation of a piece of equipment than to train three. There's no restriction on maximum size beyond the size of the facility that you have available. As a general rule, states try to have all their National Guard units train on the same weekend, as it's a lot easier to support, both from state headquarters and all the interactions at unit levels. For example, a unit requires annual medicals, they can go over to the medical unit which is on duty the same weekend. If a tank unit wants to go to a base for tactical training, it helps if the transportation company or the fuel company is also training the same weekend, and so on. It's not mandatory, these things can be worked around if they have to be. But why not leverage everybody to work together just like they would in a war? As for the question of when officers go from reserve to full time, there is no set answer for that. I believe that there are no full time reservists in the British or Irish Army Reserves. Indeed, I seem to recall that command of a reserve unit after command of a regular army unit was a prerequisite for command of a battalion for regular army officers in Ireland. 
That's probably changed since, if I even got it right in the first place, but I always thought it was an excellent idea for the circumstances. The full-time cadre would be regular officers or enlisted, and they would basically be on a tour of assignment to the reserve unit, and eventually they would cycle back out to the regular army. For the US, there's no practical difference between officers and enlisted in the reserves with respect to full-time policies. The full-time cadres are themselves reservists. They apply for full-time job positions, which are announced just as you would apply for any job. They were just requirements for rank for the jobs. These are normally called AGR, Active Guard or Reserve. Uh, but there are alternatives such as Federal Technicians or ADOS, Active Duty for Operational Support. This applies both at the unit level and at the state level. So if you go to Austin, let's say the Texas State Capitol, one of the government departments is the Texas Military Department, and it has its own series of office buildings over in Camp Mabry, and in it are a bunch of full-timers who do everything the department needs to do to keep ticking over, from personnel, paperwork, to procurement, to financial accountability operations. They will man the State Operations Center. Think of it as like the war room for emergencies, such as natural disasters. There are others that say on a full-time counter-drug mission. There are full-time mechanics doing the required period services on vehicles or repairs on vehicles that were damaged during training. Each state normally has a schoolhouse of some sort, and under the total army school system, students from any state or the federal military can attend to get the same training. So I spent four years in Nevada's uh, RTI, uh, Re Regional Training Institute. It's mainly a 25 series schoolhouse. If you are a 25 series and you want to spend six weeks in Las Vegas, Continue going there for your NCOES or your skills school. Of course, the instructors have to be full-timers, so again, AGRs, and so on. Even if you do make the absolute top rank in the state, there's not always a requirement for you to be on full-time. So the Nevada tag a while ago preferred to stick with a civilian job. However, the requirements of the position are probably such that the reality is you'd be doing army work every evening anyway, so you may as well go full-time when you're off in the position. National Guard Bureau in D.C. also consists of a lot of guardsmen, assigned from the 54 states and territories for a couple of year tour of duty. Opportunities for folks to move between regular army and reserve components start getting more limited as you go up in rank, both enlisted and officer. You have to have a slot that you can go into. So for a captain who just did his minimum six years in the active army and wants to go into the reserves, it's easy enough. If you're a full colonel, however, things start to get a bit more complicated. I've similarly known junior officers who converted from the guard to active duty, but no senior field grades, probably for two reasons. Firstly, they likely long concluded by then what they want to do in life and would have made the decision earlier. And probably they also have a similar problem of finding places to put them. The Slavin. What are my thoughts on wheeled AFVs such as the M1128? Are they a stopgap, hold the line until the MBTs get there role? Or are they in themselves effective ways to produce MBT killers? Now, of course, uh, as, as a couple of days ago, the US Army announced that it was getting rid of 1128s. They obviously weren't overly wedded to them, given that they had already reduced the basis of issue from the initial equivalent of one per rifle platoon to one per rifle company in the striker brigades. I think the rifle platoon lost a fair bit of capability when the MGSs became a platoon in the battalion, but I don't think the army is losing much now by divesting themselves of the vehicle entirely. But they were basically infantry support guns, not tank destroyers or ersatz tanks. Centauro is more of a tank destroyer, and as such had a valid concept within its limitations. At the other end of the scale is a Japanese Type 16, which from what I can gather is a tank in doctrine, designed to fill the role of the MBT when the MBT is not available, due to logistical limitations, and where arguably, for the same limitations, the other side won't have proper MBTs either, and is also down to light tanks. For lighter vehicles, there may be less of a requirement for tracks, and for all the logistical hassle which tracks also come with. What's the practical difference between Centauro as a wheeled tank destroyer and Type 16 as a maneuver combat vehicle? Probably not much, but I'd say protection and ammunition loadout. I can see the MCV maybe having a bit more protection against RPGs, missiles and the like, and a greater emphasis in general purpose round types and fusing, more ammunition. But really, the difference is probably slim. <laughs>
So they very much do have a place. The US can use the entire striker brigade as a stopgap pending heavier forces, and indeed the 1990 experience was in large part the impetus for it. Though I have to admit it completely befuddles me why the permanent US Army presence in Europe is a striker brigade and not a brigade of heavy armour. I'm sure somebody who's paid much more money than I am has a good reason for it. Grim! With M60s basically being everywhere, and so many countries keeping them in the inventory, do you think they will become like T-34s and Shermans, where they are kept in service and updated for much longer than originally designed? Surely the tank which is going to set the record for being kept in service a ridiculous amount of time is T-55. I've kind of covered the M60 upgrade question in a much much earlier Q&A, and I don't think my answer has changed much since. I'm not convinced that M60 is going to have the same length of service life as countries which could get M60s tend to be able to get next generation tanks instead. Be it Morocco getting M1s or Greece getting Leopard 2s. Interestingly, Greece is keeping the M48s around longer than the M60s due to the nature of the upgrades they were given. Taiwan is kind of doing something like the same thing with Brave Tiger. Egypt? Well, they're just building more M1s themselves to replace the M60s. So if you think about it, the countries which use M60s nowadays are either countries which really can't afford to upgrade them, like Sudan, or maybe don't really need to, so maybe Brazil. The only notable exception is Turkey, which would like to replace them all with Altes, but they can't yet, so they're doing the two upgrades, either Sabra, which includes the 120mm, or the TM, which is suited more for the lower intensity fight in Syria. Despite the large amount of upgrade options available, nobody's really going for them. They're just replacing them outright with better tanks. I'm going to pass on the aesthetics question, I think, though. USA, USA. With all rubber tracks being used in civilian and lighter military vehicles, will they ever become standard or main battle tanks? Also, were US half tracks the first military vehicles to use all rubber tracks? With respect to MBTs, I think it'll be a very long time before all rubber tracks are tough enough to handle the abuse. As for the first use of rubber tracks, one would first think of the Kegress half tracks, which saw some use in a number of countries. But Kegress didn't just do half tracks. The first tank to be equipped with full rubber tracks was an FT, actually about two dozen of them, I think, in an attempt to make the vehicle a bit faster. They were trialed in the mid 1920s and saw service in the Rift War. The tracks were also used on early versions of the NC. Kazuki K. Since M110 was retired, the Russians are the only one with SPGs over 200mm. Most everyone else uses 155, 122, or 152. Given that we are now looking at smart munitions for artillery, would it not be an advantage to have a larger caliber to accommodate a greater payload, as these smart systems are bound to take up space inside the warhead? Maybe? But remember what replaced the M110. It wasn't a tube artillery system, it was a rocket system. And for long range fires, those rockets can take the job of tube artillery quite nicely, and each rocket will lob quite a good payload. It can be cluster or smart munitions, or it can just be a nice big 227mm high explosive warhead, which in the case of MLRS is 90 kilograms of boom, and they are guided. Indeed, the French Lance Roquette Unitaire pretty much fires only big guided HE rounds. So if you're looking for a rate of fire for tube artillery, which is arguably more important than a couple of large booms a minute, you'll want to stick with the smaller caliber. If you want to lob a big round over a long distance, the provision of guidance on rockets fills the gap for you. No longer much of a need for 8 inch plus tubes. As for the question on motivation between the various jumps in sizes in US service, I'm actually not sure the answer. Obviously the 240 didn't hang around too long, but as a general rule the 155s were howitzers and the 203s were guns. Presumably there was some tactical reasoning behind why a gun couldn't be bigger. Or could be bigger. The 175 was a bit of an oddity just to get range. Juna! Why do company and higher commanders ride in tanks in most countries? Wouldn't it be better served riding command vehicles? Not really. I regret I don't have Cordingley's book with me, I think I left it in Ireland, but he basically had a choice between riding his tank into Iraq in 1991 and sticking with the brigade staff. 
He decided that if he could command a battalion from his TC's position, he could do the brigade as well. After all, he had a staff to do all the admin work, he just needed to make the decisions. And he could be closer to the front with his troops when he made them. It also turned out at one point that the brigade headquarters was under threat from an Iraqi armoured unit, and his tank was the best thing that they had to defend themselves. I guess they figured that if the CO was going to be up front in an armoured vehicle anyway, why not give him a vehicle which could fight? A company with 14 tanks is going to be more capable than one with 13 tanks in the command track. The CO also normally gets the most experienced gunner in the company, on the basis that when he needs to do CO things, he can hand off control of the tank to the gunner and focus on his map and radio. Or in a British tank, he'd hand off control of the tank to the loader, because the loader is the senior man for the Brits. In the meantime, he has, in addition to the radio, access to the view on the ground through the sights of the tank. Normally he will go with the company main effort. The XO, if he has a tank, may go with the main effort or the supporting effort. It also gives him a vehicle that he can circulate in which won't uproot the actual command vehicle. So for example, when I was a troop commander, I had a Bradley, my XO had the command track. So if I had to get the briefings, or otherwise you know, circulate around, I could take the Brad whilst letting the XO continue doing his battle management in the 1068. Back in the day, Command tanks were different from regular tanks using dummy guns and the likes, simply because of the amount of space required for all the equipment, like bigger radios. With today's technology, there's no requirement to disarm the tank just because the CO's in it. Charles Charange. Any post-war reports on UK or US opinion on Tetrarch or Locust? Well, Locust, the US realised it was a stupid idea to have a tank which was transportable by C-54. They weren't going to be using st big strategic asset on tactical missions, and besides, you needed to own the airfield you were landing on with the C-54 slash Locust, which likely wouldn't have been the case for the air assault in the first place. The British used them, of course, in uh, gliders, and Fletcher, in Operation Think Tank, covers them briefly. The takeaway from him was that there was no particular record on performance, but he doesn't think there were any practical use. I think he might have been slightly overdoing it. I mean, I can see having a small tank around to deal with armoured cars, machine guns, etc. But why not just use an armoured car for that, and less hassle? Van Owen returns us to Albonia. After the former procurement chap blew the nation's budget on garbage vehicles, pending some solution to fix it, what instructions would you give the militia or military to deal with armoured vehicles? Mines. Lots of mines. Roadside bombs, command detonated mines, pressure detonated mines. Get an artillery around, rig it up with a trigger. Mines were already responsible for a good quarter of tank casualties in World War II, so it's not as if there's no precedent for their effectiveness. Use turning obstacles to direct the tanks to where the mines are. Which reminds me, I probably need to do a video on obstacles. Ideas like digging a big hole and getting the tank to fall into it are fine, but why not just dig a much smaller hole into which the munition could be placed? Have the mines pre-registered with artillery fires. You need to kill the mechanics. Remember, these are the days before rapid mine clearing techniques. So this would be much less likely to work in the 1970s, for example. Save your presumably few anti-tank guns for flail tanks and hope the opposition doesn't obscure the breach points. Flame fugaces may be an option here. Abatis is time-honoured if the terrain allows, as does dynamiting a hillside to get big rocks to land on top of the tanks, or flooding an area, which is of course also terrain dependent. Note, I ain't going for the direct approach here. Saying that you should kill the fuel trucks or whatever is all very well, but in most cases, it's going to be easier said than done. Presume that you will only be allowed to see and engage combat units. If you can get lucky and hit a fuel supply convoy, great, but it's probably not worth relying on. Josh Conti. In Normandy, the hedgerows provided a natural and dangerous obstacle. What was deadlier against Allied armor columns? Panzers, AT guns, or infantry units? The problem with the premise of your question, I think, is the idea that an armoured column would be trundling along in the hedgerows of Normandy. This was close, nasty terrain and an infantry fight. An American unit would rarely lead with the tank going around the corner and then you know, come face to face with a pack or a panzer. 
From doing a quick check in the 80s infantry's armor, the priority threat to M4s was the handheld anti-tank, uh, followed by AT guns. The ranges tended to be extremely short, with hedgerows averaging about 70 meters from each other. Sebastian Cranin. How does one as tall as me trick the army into letting me be a tanker? I just wrote that I was 6'3 on the application form. Actually, it turned out that nobody checks once you're in the system. When you sign your contract, there is a checklist of criteria against which you are rated. So for a 19K, a tanker, I would have been prohibited as being too tall and too colorblind. I would have passed on the aptitude requirements, though. For 19 Delta, Cavalry Scout, I'd have been too colorblind, which is another piece of silliness, and colorblind personnel were specifically sought for reconnaissance roles in World War II. However, I signed on as a 09 Sierra, which is a contract for a shot at OCS. There are no height limitations for OCS, and my color vision was good enough to read a map. So that was that. At the end of OCS, we did the branching process, at which point it was just a case of putting names to slots, and nobody was asking for pulling medical records. Either that, or I just begged sufficiently well, as you could see from the form. Philip Gertler, thoughts on Challenger 3. What the hell is it with you, dog? This is the wife's dog. The dog is not evil like a cat, but I still don't get on well with her. Philip Gundler, thoughts on Challenger 3? Seems like it'll be a reasonable tank, but I'm wondering about some of the fitted for but not with options. Challenger 2 is already one of the heavier tanks out there, and this Challenger 3 is listed officially as 66 tons metric. Adding trophy to the Abrams adds, as I recall correctly, the better part of 4 tons to the vehicle. And Charlie 3 is listed as having the option to add APS. Maybe they're waiting for something lighter than Trophy to be invented. The apparent lack of a remote weapon system is also interesting given the trends that most other countries seem to be going with. The fusible rounds and battlefield management system I'm sure are fine. And if the auto target identification and tracking system works, so much the better for it. I'd like to take a good look at the turret front. There are one or two extra optics there. I'm not quite sure that they're for the laser warning system. As new armor, good. New suspension, good. Hopefully they retained the automated track tensioning system. The upgraded engine has improved cooling, but I note the advertising doesn't say it's actually any more powerful. They do say that it's faster, but that may just be a suspension thing. The big question, and I haven't seen anyone address it, is why the British kept with the four-man crew. I've argued in the past, and I stand by it, that there's no point in just fitting an autoloader to a current turret. You would need to design an entirely new turret to take advantage of it. Chally 3 has an all-new turret, but a human loader. And I would refer to the earlier comment about weight. Presumably they have their reasons, but it does seem a little bit odd when the entire rest of their army is going lighter. I guess the only other question is why they're talking about a full service capability in 2030. M1A2 SEP V3 was announced in 2017 and was being fielded within three years. I would also be very curious to see the crew interfaces, particularly the gunner's control handles. And no, I doubt that there will be a Captain Scarlet watch party. Seb Cranin, I'm starting to see a couple of people asking multiple questions here. Was there anything I really wish I'd had in the M1 other than an air conditioner? cool running water. Not that it was incredibly inconvenient to get out of the tank and get water or Gatorade out of the cooler in the bustle rack. Challenger 2's track tension system. HE ammunition. Pretty much the same answer for the Bradley. A way of getting the gun mount and feeder in and out of the Bradley without removing skin would also have been nice. Flipped Sherman. Odd name. I've been reading Spearhead, and the book mentions how one tanker had as many as five Shermans knocked out from under him. 
Is it possible that the Sherman's reputation stuck because so many crewmen lived to tell the tales? P.S. If you haven't read Spearhead, I recommend it. You'll find I'm mentioned in the book as having gone over it before release, but anyway. But yeah, somewhat facetiously maybe, I have observed in the past how many of the Sherman crewmen calling it a death trap are not actually dead. Of course, it's a bit self-fulfilling. I mean, even if 90% had died, the 10% who had left would be the 100% of the people talking and equally not dead. But predominantly, yes, there is a bit of an effect of people who are alive to remember the negative experiences, which themselves are not neutral. So every one of the 90-some survivors of a tank company will remember and talk about the time that the company jokester, a popular man and friend, burned to death in his tank. They will not much remember and talk about the three Germans who they never knew and were killed in the burning panzer that they encountered a few hours later. Perception bias is a thing. Jay, it's been said that tracks don't necessarily mean that something is a tank. Does it even have to be land capable to be a tank? Witness the tank boat. And they actually do call it tank boat. Sounds like something from the sci-fi channel. If the MI-24 is a flying tank, I don't see why tank boat can't be a floating tank. I think, though, it's actually closer to being a fire support vehicle than a tank. Mike Quinton, does an infantry company carry enough anti-armor ammunition to kill a tank company? Thinking particularly with regard to ERA and the requirement to blow through blocks. Probably not if you're relying on blowing off of ERA panels for a second shot in the same place. Yeah, it won't be accurate enough anyway. Hopefully you'll hit lower hull side, engine compartment, hatch. ERA does help protect, but it's not complete coverage. Light infantry anti-armor anyway is really more geared towards light armor. I think leave the tanks to the guys with the proper anti-tank missiles like javelin or tow. Right. I think that's about it. Q&A complete. I hope you found it interesting and informative. And I will talk to you on the next one. Take care.